Now, if you walk up and down the halls of any building, this does not happen because everybody's on their phones. <laughs> only in only an opening day do we get chaotic conversations, which should happen all the time. But thank you for being here today. I appreciate it very much. And welcome to 2017. Uh, <clears throat> I was thinking about 2017 and, um, and uh, what that means to uh, many of us um, in terms of starting something new. And I hope for you the, the start has been good. Um, I know that for s some families and people, the start is rough. The holidays are a very difficult time and can be a difficult time. And I'm, you know, I'm very fortunate that we had a very chaotic holiday season, but not um, disastrous. Okay, I'll put it in that category. So I hope <laughs> it was pleasant chaos in uh, my, my family and the size of my family and the changes that everybody's going through in life. But anyway, I hope, I hope your time was good, and I hope your time uh, was uh, reflective and you had the opportunity to take care of yourself and spend time with friends and family and forget about Cuesta College. Um, <clears throat> because now we're back, and we're back for action. And I'd like to uh, welcome some guests this morning. And uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce um, two of our members of our Board of Trustees. Our newest member, who was just elected uh, last November and took and was seated um, as a trustee at the December 14th meeting. And I discovered this morning was a high school classmate of Gary Villa. So that, that doesn't, don't, don't take that badly for her, you know. <laughs> you know we, we've, I've, I've, I've told Mary that uh, he's, he's turned out okay, okay. So I'd like to introduce uh, Mary Strobridge, our newest uh, trustee. Thank you. Mary uh, represents Area 5, which is the Atascadero, Creston, Santa Margarita, and Northern San Luis Obispo area. Uh, took the place of Dick Hitchman, who had to resign <clears throat> from the board for health reasons. Um, he's now relocated down, I believe, around Lake Elsinore. He has an uh, onset of Parkinson's, and uh, so he needed to be closer to family, and so we were sorry to, to see um, Dick leave, um, but we understood why he needed to leave, and he was most concerned about not compromising his ability to be an effective board member, and that is so Dick. You know, that is so Dick Hitchman that he only wanted to be able to play the game at his highest uh, performance level. Dick, you remember, replaced the retiring board member of Gay Galvin, who had served multiple terms. And, and I'm sad to report that, that uh, Gay is in a grave health condition um, with terminal cancer. And so we're praying for her every day and her family, and we're sorry to hear of her stated condition. And um, I'd also I'd like to introduce, no stranger to many of us, who was a executive director of our foundation at advancement for 25 years, and now president of the Board of Trustees, Barbara George. Thank you. <laughs> so Barbara and I, and I have had this long time relationship between I'm her boss, she's now my boss. You know, this kind of goes back and forth. And uh, so, <laughs> so I'm really glad uh, to see Barbara willing to t uh, step up and take the leadership of our uh, Board of Trustees. Pat Mullen stepped aside after nine years as the Board President, and the Board has decided to go back to a rotational schedule. And so we're going to see more uh, rotational and leadership opportunities uh, for our trustees. Later on this morning, um, we'll have the opportunity to feature uh, two more individuals. I'd like to introduce uh, former Cuesta students and now Cuesta honored alums, uh, Jim Gregory and Frank Meacham. They're here today. Thank you. And you'll hear more about their stories and what Cuesta College did for them. 
The other, we have a third honoree, but he is in Mexico and would not be able to join us this morning. And they will also be honored by the foundation um, on March 24th at the annual awards uh, function that the foundation puts on. So now let's uh, move on. Remember, uh, opening day is in the spring is, a, is an opportunity for recognition. We want to welcome the new faces that have joined us since September to join the Cuesta family. We also want to say goodbye to those who are leaving us through retirement, um, many of whom retired last month. But I want to recognize them as well as identify those who are going to uh, move on into the sunset uh, this spring. We'll also be uh, presenting other awards. Um, we have the Elaine Holly Coates um, Outstanding Service Award, and then the Academic Senate has two awards, the Mame Diffley Faculty Award and the uh, <coughs> Faculty Inspiration Award, uh, uh, given in the name of Virginia Sullivan, who is Jack Sullivan's uh, mother. We'll also recognize our honored alums more formally um, and give them the backstory of who they are and what they've done and why they're here today. And then we have two really, uh, really important uh, presentations today. You know, we live now in a, a continually evolving world of technology. And many of our lives are affected and impacted and enhanced and sometimes uh, challenged uh, by technology. And so we have uh, two presentations today. One on the, the application of a new piece of software called Maxient, which is going to help us in terms of managing uh, much of our lives in relationship to dealing with, with student and staff issues and, and referrals, et cetera. You'll hear more about that. And then also, um, we're launching into the world of Canvas and uh, Cynthia Wilshies and will give us a presentation on what that means for, for us. And then finally, you'll have the distinct pleasure of listening to me. <laughs> or the burden. <laughs> and you will be uh, conspicuous by your absence. Okay. All right, with that, um, I would like to uh, invite uh, the vice presidents are going to introduce the new um, uh, hires within their particular clusters. Uh, my cluster is going to be represented by uh, Melissa Richardson, Vice President of Human Resources and Labor Relations. So, uh, Melissa, why don't you start off, and then the vice presidents can just uh, follow from that. So they're going to introduce the new, new hires in their areas. Thank you. So for the president's cluster, we welcomed Rick Camarillo, Director of Foundation Fiscal Services, Anthony Herrera, graphic designer, Katie Nellison, Foundation's program coordinator, Monica Banta, benefit specialist, Diane Brigantz, payroll specialist, Sarah Farmer, human resources assistant, Amy LaRue, institutional research analyst, and Jamie Snyder, payroll technician. Okay, well, I messed that up. I guess I wasn't next. Yes, I'm next. Okay. <laughs> I'd like to introduce the new people who are joining us in the student services cluster. And we have a lot. Um, and some people are having new assignments as well. So uh, Karen Andrews is, uh, was reclassified and is now the Veteran Services Coordinator. Uh, yeah. And, you know, remember, if you, if you were here on the first day, remember we had the, the one clap? after each person's name. Let's, let's do that again, because that was really fun. OK. And so we also have Darlene Avito. She's a financial aid department assistant, and she's new this semester. And we have Mary Campos. Mary is a counselor in CAFE. And she used to be a classified uh, employee, and now she's part-time faculty. And Maddie Davis is a CAFE technician, and she's new with us this year. Kat Gritton has been here with us a long time, 
and she is now the department chair for student services, which is a new position. Ah, screwed that one up. Okay. Uh, Sarah Henning is a financial aid technician, and she's new. And Ariana Jimenez is the University Transfer and Career Spe Services Specialist, and she's also new to us. And Susan Landry is a Disability Specialist. She's working part-time faculty for us. And Erin Lestrato has re been reclassified, and she is a, the director now of Assessment M3SP. Yeah. <laughs> And Danielle Leone is an admissions and records technician, and she's a new hire for A&R. And Matthew Lizona, uh, Lizano excuse me, is a financial aid technician, and he's new with us this semester. And let's see, oh, Sonia Mendoza. Sonia Mendoza is our South County Center assistant, and she's been with us for a long time as an A&R clerk, but now she is the South County Center assistant, although she's on maternity leave and won't be back until the end of January. Uh, Shirley Rown is a disability specialist, and she was a classified employee, and she's now part-time faculty for us. Antonio Tway is new, but she used to be, a long time ago, hourly and classified, and now she's back with us working in the cafe as an assistant. And Ron Venable is brand new to us. Uh, two days, three days, Ron? And Ron comes to us from Texas. He's our new director for dsp &S. And we are very happy to have him. Um, Judith West is joining us. She was a longtime uh, temporary employee, and now she is a registered nurse for our Student Health Center. And we've got wonderful new people, but when, as that happens, we have lost four really long people, well, long-term people, who uh, gave 92 years of service all collect, not all at once. I mean, not. Um, <laughs> although I don't know, I think Dr. Stork is working on that. Uh, <laughs> I'm a short timer. That means my last semester. I don't have to, you know. Um, so, uh, but but to, uh, collectively, these four people gave 92 years of service to our students, and we had uh, Chris Wayland, who was here for 33 years, and she retired in December. Can so, Candy Munoz, who was here for 28 years, just retired in December out of counseling, and. He took his wife with him, Julie, uh, <laughs> so they got to go off in the sunset together. Uh, she'd been here with us uh, as a prerequisite analyst for 10 years. And then Terry Katz also left after uh, 21 years in our Student Health Center. So I'm sure they're all sitting there having a cup of coffee this morning going, say, I'm not there. Isn't that cool? But it's nice to give them uh, that, that round of applause anyway. So those are our student services, uh, new faces, and retirees. I may be biased, but I believe administrative services is the most important cluster. So, <laughs> so. so uh, I'm going to tell you about some of the new assignments and new faces we have uh, in that fantastic uh, cluster. Uh, Shanna Ahrens is our new supervising accountant. She moved up from being our budget accountant. So uh, the one clap, should we do that? Okay. For Shanna. Uh, uh, David Borla is a new face. is our custodian one in maintenance operations and ground. So let's hear it for David. I'm just behind there. Uh, Emily Conrad is our new budget accountant. Uh, she moved on from uh, uh, a prior position, so we're happy to have her. She gets to work closely with me now, so isn't, isn't she lucky? Uh, Sam Houston has been uh, reclassified as an auxiliary services technician, so let's hear it for Sam. Uh, Andrew Kralisek is a new general maintenance worker, so welcome to Andrew. Uh, Clint Martin uh, has also been reclassified as an auxiliary services technician, so let's hear it for him. Sharice McGee, also reclassified, a bookstore purchasing uh, web specialist. Uh, Edward Pignon, a new custodian in maintenance operations and grounds. Uh, Fatma Shahadi is our new public safety support assistant. She was an hourly in the bookstore before that. Uh, Jason Stinson has been uh, just recently reclassified as our senior police officer, so congratulations, Jason. Uh, and Wendy Wagner is a new uh, repro specialist. Uh, well, she's not, she's not new, but you know, she's been reclassified. She's been here a long time. <laughs> 
Uh, Jennifer Madrid obviously could not stand working in my office, so she's been um, uh, re uh, reassigned as a uh, fiscal analyst, so congratulations to Jennifer. Uh, we do have one person leaving, and this, so this is bad for us, but good for her, obviously. Uh, after, uh, I think, close to 30 years, Linda Brizolara has moved on from purchasing. She retired in December, so we're not buying anything. <laughs> Sorry. And that's all I got. Thank you. Good morning. Happy Friday the 13th. What a way to start spring semester. Uh, welcome all of you back. We're so excited. A new semester and things are going to be great. So I'm going to do it a little bit differently. You still get to do the one clap. I'm not going to do the ole like Dan did, but I'm going to have you guys coordinate that. But if you're here, please stand up. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so here are some of our new uh, individuals that are joining Academic Affairs. Nick Bockelman, Fine Arts. In his faculty. Serena Caesar, academic success coach. All right, Serena, welcome. Kelly Cohn, faculty library. Uh, Claudia Faraday, who is the coordinator of the Basic Skills Transformation Grant. Hey. <laughs> uh, Paige Gill, faculty business education. Claire Hawkins, who's now the coordinator of the Basic Skills Transformation Grant. Uh, Julie Howard, who's faculty in WED and CP. Gary Kuhn, who's uh, an instructor for uh, Emeritus. Julie Labreco, uh, cl clerical assistant three. Margaret Lugaris, a toddler and preschool assistant teacher. Polly Mertens is a faculty in the business education department. Uh, Lisa Nawful, Applied Music Instructor. Uh, Jennifer Noriega, who's a Student Success Center Support Technician. You guys are doing so well on your own. All right. Uh, Lauren Rayburn, Faculty of Fine Arts. Uh, Jean Ann Ruck, who is now our head softball coach. Yay, another one. That's great. Uh, Elizabeth Sign, Faculty of Social Science. Keith Wabel, Applied Music Instructor. We have Michael Caslunovo, who's in Business Education. Uh, Yvonne Auberg in Fine Arts. Uh, we have Andrea Terry, who's in Lancome. Belinda Morrill, who's in Social Science. Uh, Benjamin Arona, who's in Social Science. Uh, Deborah Reyes Gardner, who's in WED. And we have Cinta, Cin, excuse me, Cynthia, uh, Cynthia Vanessa Salalis Vendrum, who's in business education. And then we have Andrian Lomp. So thank you, you guys did very well. <laughs> kind of petered out a little bit, but anyway, have a great semester. We'll see you around the block. So uh, one of the uh, <clears throat> responsibilities that each of us has is to help the newcomers uh, that come to Cuesta College <clears throat> be engaged and, and feel welcome. So if any of you are here that was name was read during that whole period of time, will you please all stand right now so we can see who you are? Please stand and remain standing. Okay. Thank you. So it's our responsibility now to make sure you reach out and welcome the individual you see standing or congratulate them on their change of assignment. So let them know who you are. Uh, let them know that um, you're there to help them, especially if they need to find a restroom or something, you know, <laughs> you know do the most important things, yeah, help them. I also want to um, acknowledge uh, some other retirees that uh, have 
that uh, departed in December. We actually had about, <clears throat> about uh, 15 individuals retire in December, some of whom have already been mentioned by uh, Pat. But also, in the, uh, we had several part-time faculty members who uh, have retired from active teaching. Uh, these include uh, Roger Lee from Fine Arts, Doug Monteith from Mathematics, Alexis Olds from Language and Communications, David Rackley in Performing Arts, Carol Simard in Mathematics, and Janice Ward in Language and Communications. We've also had uh, several staff members uh, uh, retire besides uh, Terry, Julie, and Chris that Pat mentioned. Uh, from the library is uh, Jeannie Amador, uh, Terry Croxton, after 46 years, I believe, uh, retired. And uh, Vicki Simonson, a division assistant uh, in business and engineering. And uh, Linda Brizolera in purchasing. Now, and, and then of course you mentioned that uh, Kenny Munoz uh, slipped out the door um, in December and dragged his wife with him and they're off having fun. Now, coming up, uh, we have some retirees who have been who have submitted their letter of retirement and have been accepted by the Board of Trustees. Later on this month, we're going to say goodbye to library technician uh, Jean Bartel. So those of you who know Jean, make sure you wish her well. I know there's been some of these little parties running around and so on, but there will be probably be more. We have three uh, faculty members who are going to leave us this uh, May, a part-time faculty member and former coordinator of our, of our art gallery, Marta Peluso. And then uh, tenured uh, faculty members who will be leaving, uh, uh, mathematics uh, faculty member Richard Taylor, and also uh, automotive technician uh, training uh, Gary Villa. So they'll be leaving us uh, this spring. And then finally, in uh, July, uh, we have another person who's going to not only be leaving us, but he's leaving the state, I found out yesterday. He's moving to Arkansas. Uh, Director of Library Learning Resources and Distance Education, Mark Stengel. So we're going to uh, miss them. So, Dan, make sure you get their keys. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Well, well on with the uh, recognitions and awards. The first award we're going to be giving uh, today is the Elaine Holly Coates Servants Excellence Award. This award was uh, uh, renamed a few years ago in honor of Elaine Holly Coates, uh, who was the very first uh, classified employed, uh, employee hired at Cuesta College. She was actually the fourth employee hired at Cuesta College besides uh, the president, the two vice presidents, and then Elaine was hired to take care of them and make sure they did the right thing. Um, <clears throat> Chris Whalen was the very first uh, member who uh, received this award in Elaine's uh, honor. The Service Excellence Award is given to an employee who has gone above and beyond. They show professionalism, provide support to their colleagues, and inspire others. And I'm pleased to announce this year's winner of the Elaine Holly Coates Service Excellence Award to Vicki Schemmer. So Vicki, will you please come forward? Please? Surprise, surprise. <laughs> well, let me tell you a little bit about Vicki and why her colleagues have um, chosen her or selected her and nominated her for this recognition. She establishes a warm and professional welcome to all community, faculty, and staff who enter the Human Development Division building by actually knowing all the parents' and students' names 
for those who attend the Children's uh, Center at Cuesta College. She is engaged with faculty and staff, as well as with her knowledge of our professional needs and genuine concern for our personal life, too. She never hesitates to help whoever needs it and doesn't stop until there is a solution or a resolution, even following up before or after work with her cell phone. That's a violation of the contract, isn't it, Melissa? <laughs> Yeah. Her organizational skills and understanding of division history exceed expectations. She places her professional and personal touch on advisory board meetings and division meetings. Last and perhaps most important, she is patient and positive beyond measure with a continuous high volume flow of staff and faculty needs, requests and demands always maintaining a calm and professional demeanor that infiltrates the atmosphere, setting a wonderful tone for the entire division. She keeps, these are uh, no, uh, comments from faculty and staff. She learned, as I said before, she learns everybody's name and she's like, and she's faculty to, uh, as well. She's so engaged. There's never a time she doesn't stop what she's doing to help you. She's simply amazing, like the best executive and team mom all at once. She keeps our deadlines on track, is at the ready to answer any questions, can fix the repro machine with her eyes closed, all, <laughs> all with a sense of humor. Did you know that's we're talking about your mom? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's not what I heard you say earlier about your mom. No. So ladies and gentlemen, it's uh, my pleasure to uh, again congratulate Vicki as the recipient of the Elaine Holly Coates Service Excellence Award. Thank you for this wonderful award. I'm shocked. Now I know why Don texted me this morning. <laughs> um, I just want to say that Quest has been such a big part of my life. Uh, coming here first as a student and playing sports here uh, is just wonderful to uh, be able to give back to all the students that are attending now and for the future. Um, thank you to my division <laughs> and Hyla. Um, I'm just really honored and surprised. Thank you. <laughs> And I'd like to uh, welcome to the podium Academic Senate President, uh, Dr. Lara Baxley. Hello there. Uh, first, I would like to make a quick announcement to the faculty. Um, we are going to start the faculty meeting 15 minutes after the general session ends. So if the general session ends early, we're going to start early. So I want to let you know that. Uh, now, I have the distinct pleasure of uh, presenting the Peter and Mamey Diffley Award for Faculty Excellence. This award was established by Peter Diffley in the name of his wife, Mamey Diffley, who passed away in 1987. The award recognizes faculty excellence in the role as a teacher at Cuesta College in addition to being involved with one or more of the following. Community and or campus activism, environmental or ecological concerns, involvement in the arts, or special motivation to science students. This award, which is sponsored by the foundation, includes a plaque and a check. It is my pleasure to announce that the winner of this year's Peter MMA Diffley Award is Brett Clark.
I was very excited to be able to tell Michelle um, <laughs> about this award while she was over at our house for dinner last week. <laughs> Brett just told me, you can really keep a secret. You have no idea how long I've been keeping this secret. Uh, Brett is an outstanding professor of both physics and chemistry, and he is my division chair in the physical sciences division. Brett's lectures are reported to be highly organized, entertaining, and effective. Brett captures student interest with a great sense of humor, and his incorporates practical examples from his background as an engineer, pilot, scuba diver, and 49ers fan. <laughs> Brett's often, office hours often have a line out the door with his students rushing to be first in line for extra assistance. Brett is well known for, for providing challenging course content and the tools to help his students succeed, not only in his class, but in their future careers. One former student wrote that any teacher can be hard, but Clark has the talent to be a hard teacher and still be a good teacher. <laughs> Another former student said, when I transferred to Cal Poly to study mechanical engineering, the problem solving skills I acquired from Professor Clark allowed me to perform in the top of my engineering classes. Brett's motivation for assisting science students can be seen in his extensive involvement as advisor to the STEM club. With Brett's guidance and assistance, the club has held several fundraisers and taken a trip to Morro Bay Aquarium and the Exploratorium and have planned a trip to tour a refinery. Brett has provided critical organization and assistance in the running of the club booth at the annual Children's Day in the Plaza in downtown San Luis Obispo. He has also secured a full-size wind tunnel for st the STEM club to model airflow and fluid dynamics. Brett's students adore him so much that one year, the club made hats with a saying that he often says in class on the top of the hats. Brett is a terrific role model for students showing that scientists can be hardworking, fun-loving, and creative. To sum up Brett's involvement with students, his club submitted this quote. Like a harmonic motion differential equation with repeated real roots, Clark has critically prepared his students. <laughs> that sums it all up. Congratulations, Brett. <laughs> you know, this, uh, for those of you that know me, uh, this may be the first time that I've been caught a little bit speechless. So, um, about 18 years ago, I <clears throat> I uh, stopped my last job. Um, that was working in the real world, and I now uh, basically have the opportunity every day to come and work with you all and to uh, teach our students. And uh, I absolutely love it. So um, I I really appreciate this. Uh, thanks to my family for coming down, my mom and dad, and wife and daughter, and uh, it's quite an honor, especially given um, the past recipients and, uh, and I'm sure the future ones as well. So thank you again. And now I have the opportunity to uh, present the Virginia Sullivan Inspirational Faculty Award. This award was established by Cuesta College Emeritus faculty Jack Sullivan in the name of his mother, Virginia Sullivan, who served as a model of inspiration and encouragement for her colleagues. The focus on this award is on fostering or exhib exhibition of characteristics which support growth and overall well-being of faculty colleagues. This award recognizes dynamic, motivating, nurturing faculty who create a positive work environment through acts which support morale, provide expertise and mentoring, and contribute to the mental health of colleagues. This award is presented also with a plaque and a monetary award. 
The recipient of this award is one of the first people I met when I walked onto campus on a flex week before my very first um, semester at Cuesta College. And this person warmly greeted me with a huge smile and a lovely handshake. And every time I see this person, I just feel so uplifted. And this person is uh, Cheryl Zeal. Cheryl is one of the only, sorry, Cheryl is the only full-time faculty member in the college sex, success studies department. <laughs> While teaching a full load of classes, Cheryl is responsible for her department's evaluations, committee representation, part-time hiring, program review, and more. Cheryl's leadership, vision, and positive attitude have been vital as her department has changed its name once and its division twice in the past several years. Even at her busiest, Cheryl is a role model for lifelong learning and professional growth. She regularly volunteers to greet students at the beginning of each semester at the welcome booths on both campuses. Faculty, remember to sign up to sit at the welcome booths. <laughs> now I've lost my place, okay. Um, she also provides workshops for Cuesta faculty to learn about college success courses and shares research-based information about strategies faculty can employ to support student success in their courses. Recently, Cheryl has also been actively involved in the pre-semester workshops for students, partnering with counselors and faculty in various disciplines. Her enthusiasm for subjects and the students that are served in the CSS department is contagious and inspiring even to me. In addition to her dedication to helping students, Cheryl is also a mentor to other faculty in her department, sharing her resources, class assignments, research, and research interests. She has also been an advocate for faculty in applying for funding to participate in conferences and training. In nominating Cheryl for this award, one faculty member wrote, she has been instrumental in cultivating my passion for student learning strategies, theories, and most recently, brain research and the t teaching of growth mindset. The nominator also wrote, I hope that one day I can be as dynamic, inspiration, influential, and nurturing as she has been as a faculty leader in the College Success Studies Department. Congratulations, Cheryl. A few words. How much time do I have? <laughs> Thank you. This means a lot. I haven't submitted my letter, but this will be my last semester. And I really appreciate this, and it isn't for the love or the passion. 34 years ago, I had just finished my comps and my master's, and I needed a job. And Cuesta hired me six months pregnant with my daughter, who just turned 34 in December. It has been a beautiful, challenging, inspiring journey. And it's the faculty, it's the staff, it's our students, it's the administration, it's the family of Cuesta that I've grown to love and have taught me so much. Just yesterday I attended the workshop. Um, kudos to the professional development for what you provided. I, I had a dilemma, which workshop to go to? They were so good. This is great. Cultural humility. How, best practices for equity. How about these? A panel of seasoned faculty, which I am. I wasn't on that one. And I listened, and I went. 
about what do you do the first day to make students feel comfortable? When we came in here today, what do we talk about? Did you feel what it felt like? Everybody was talking, everybody was happy. We're comfortable here. It's our job to help and reach out to our students and to everyone on this campus learning community to feel comfortable and that they belong. And I think it comes with humility and to look at what we can do and keep learning. And as I was walking in here today, uh, Susan Lloyd said, I remember you telling me, have fun even while you're working. And I, I said, thank you for reminding me about that. Because those of you that know me well know I really like to have fun. <laughs> and if I'm not having fun, and, and fun, you learn more. The brain research is out on that. When you're comfortable, check it out. Learning in the brain. So um, I want to commend um, Dickie and Brett for your awards. And I thank everyone for giving me this beautiful award. And, um, and all the new people, get out there. Don't be silo. Get out. Find out what Cuesta has to offer. Take workshops. Keep learning, because this is where you can have a life of learning. And those workshops I attended, which were inspiring, they were free. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lara, for the uh, presentation. Um, you, you know what? You don't know what a challenge it is for Brett, uh, given you know his job here at Cuesta College and uh, why he was really deserving of that award because he lives next door to me, <laughs> and uh, it's very difficult, you know, living next door to me uh, because I'm always watching him. And uh, he's truly a renaissance man. He can do more things than I've ever, ever seen anybody be able to do. He's had more careers, more starts and stops than I think that you, you looked at his full resume. But the greatest gift that Brett brings to me is Brittany, his little girl, who's a first grader. You know, she comes over, you know, I, I, I go in and out of the community. I'm Dr. Stork and Mr. Stork and somebody's dad or somebody's grandfather. But to Brittany, she walks up on the door and she says, Hi, Gil. <laughs> Hi, Jan. Can I come in? Yeah. So she's my BFF, I'll tell you. She is. Uh, and we had this wonderful conversation. I, I went home to, uh, yesterday afternoon for a while because we had an Apple TV problem, crisis time. And she was sitting at our, our kitchen table with my wife. And she was telling my wife about the secret, the secret that she couldn't tell anybody about her dad. <laughs> it, was, it was priceless. Yeah, it was priceless. Anyway, um, it's always uh, wonderful to recognize our own. And thank you all for uh, taking the time to nominate your fellow colleagues uh, and workers to uh, receive the recognition that all of us deserve, uh, but many of us have to represent the, the major part. At this time, we're going to uh, take a look back in time at um, students that chose to come to Cuesta College and took the full advantage of what we had to offer during their period of time, and also to take a look at what they did with the opportunity and how they went out in the world and leverage that Cuesta experience to do something very special. The foundation sponsors uh, through our alumni association recognizing honored alums. And this year, uh, the selection committee was chaired by uh, Tim Williams, who's the founder and owner of Digital West, who's also an honored alum, uh, Cuesta College. Uh, that committee came up with uh, three nominees and award winners this year two of whom are here today. And I said before, uh, Ted Emmerich, 
who was the uh, the third individual who would not, could not be here today because he is currently in uh, Mexico. And ironically, we have, uh, we have a representative from the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s. No. And just by looking at me, you'll be able to tell. No. So let me talk about, uh, the, the, young, let me talk about the youngest kid on the block, and that's uh, Ted Emmerich. Ted was here in in the 80s, the early 80s, the middle 80s, he keep coming back in the, in the early 90s. Uh, he was born and raised in Solano Beach. He holds three associate degrees from Cuesta College, one in general studies, one in two-dimensional art, and one in three-dimensional art, as well as a bachelor's in fine arts from the San Francisco Art Institute, where, uh, which he achieved uh, via full-ride scholarship he won from the Moro uh, Bay Art Society. Today, Ted resides in Los Osos, where he runs a large art studio that occasionally hosts other well-known artists. He is a contemporary multimedia painter and sculptor. He uses anything and everything to create art. Ted's work has been highly sought after, not only by renowned art collectors, but also galleries throughout the United States, Canada, and Mexico. Now you know why he's there. Additionally, his works have been purchased by Apple Computers, Caesars Palace in Las Vegas, the Berkeley Library, the Chicago International Airport, and more. Ted divides his time between his art and his community. He has been involved with Surfing for Hope, Amp Surf, Art Legacy Project, Native Plant Garden Project, and the Morro Bay High School Soccer Program, as well as his own nonprofit, BeGreen.org dedicated to guiding others to a greener, more environmentally conscious life. Ted is the father of one daughter, Sierra, who is earning her degree in environmental science at UCSB. So Ted couldn't be with us today. He will be recognized and honored at the March 24th um, Foundation Awards uh, time. So now let's roll a little bit further back to the 70s. Specifically, 1971 to 1973. Think, I want you all now picture where you were. As some of you, there were, we, we didn't even know who you were going to be, yeah. <laughs> Many of you. I know where I was in 1971, 73, I was right here, yeah. So let me invite Jim Gregory up, please. This is Jim Gregory. <clears throat> Good job. Jim was raised in Roy Grandy along with his brother and two sisters. Upon graduating from uh, Roy Grandy High School, Jim attended Cuesta College and studied, studied journalism history. During his time at Cuesta, Jim was the editor of the Questonian. He continued his studies at the University of Missouri at uh, Columbia, where he received his bachelor's degree, and at Cal Poly, where he earned his teaching credential. Before becoming a teacher, Jim was an editor and newspaper reporter. He has also worked as a research historian for the San Luis Obispo County Historical Society. Jim taught American literature, modern world literature, cultural anthropology, AP U.S. history, and AP European history for 30 years at Arroyo Grande High School and Mission College Prep. During his time at Arroyo Grande High, were you teaching at the same time Brett was? Oh, yeah. Oh. And you survived. God, <laughs> thank you. Jim was the advisor of the Interact Service Club, which is a student organization uh, uh, sponsored by Rotary, an effort to raise funding for a variety of international projects, including lab equipment for schools in Uganda, defibrillators for pediatric hospitals on, in Honduras, and wheelchairs for disabled students in central Mexico. Jim has had several student trips to Europe, as well as taught teen workshop at the Central Coast Writers Conference at Cuesta College. Jim was awarded the Lucia Mar Unified School District Teacher of the Year Award in 2010-11. Since his retirement in 2015, Jim has written two books on South County history, World War II Arroyo Grande and Patriot Graves, Discovering a California Town's Civil War Heritage. He just graciously gave me copies of those two books and I'm really anxious to, to read some of our local history. Jim is married to Elizabeth, a teacher and campus minister at St. Joseph's High School in Santa Maria, and the father of two sons, John and Thomas. Please welcome Jim Gregory. Uh, 
I am honored to follow such excellent teachers. And when I would spend my time at Cuesta, uh, my teaching was formed by excellent teachers. Uh, during my time here, uh, both my brother and I, as Dr. Stork mentioned, were editors of the Questonian. Our journalism teacher was named Bob Tomlinson. Tomlinson not only taught us about journalism, he taught us integrity. And that's a lesson that I've carried with me all my life. Uh, I suffer from a social anxiety, which makes it difficult some days for me to go out and get the newspaper on the front lawn. Gene Shelton was a speech teacher who helped me to overcome that. I spent 30 years speaking to teenagers. I still like them. <laughs> and I wouldn't have been a teacher, I don't think, except for the excellent teaching I received in Mr. Shelton's class. I can still spot an outcropping of serpentine from 250 yards, thanks to John Bowen, who was a superb geology teacher and the toughest and best C I ever earned in my life. <laughs> and finally, every year when I taught European history, I would show my kids Kenneth Branagh's Agincourt speech from Henry V. Every year I thought of Lee Bedell and his superb teaching of Henry IV, part one, young Prince Hal and Falstaff, how funny they were and how salacious. I think some of the line readings that Lee taught us I would not have learned if I'd gone to a Baptist college. <laughs> the thing about teaching is that we teachers tend to overlook our own influence and our own power which I think extends beyond our own lifetimes. Those four teachers were very much a part of my teaching every day in the classroom. I carried them all my teaching career, and so my kids learned from my quest of teachers, not just from me. And it's a great honor for me to make one more announcement. One of your new hires, Elizabeth Sign, a history instructor, was one of my students too. Thank you. And now we roll back into the 60s. Actually, somebody who was here before I was. Can you believe that? I was going to say older than dirt. No, but no. Uh, but it's my pleasure to uh, introduce um, a student who was here in 1965, the first year of full operation um, in the old campus across the creek, where we offered a full, the first year of full uh, day and evening classes on that site. I'd like to welcome Frank Meacham. Frank? <laughs> I'll tell you a little side story before I tell about him. It was about uh, two months after I accepted to come back in in 2010 as the interim president, and I was invited to come up to Paso Robles and be on a, a talk show on KPRL. And it's one of those like Congleton where you have a, a topic, you discuss it, and then they open the lines and people call in. And uh, so I was a little nervous. I didn't know who was going to come out of the woodwork, you know. And uh, so soon we got through with the chit chat on, you know, what's going to happen at Cuesta College, et cetera. You know, all of a sudden, opened the lines for calling. First call, bingo. And it says, the caller says, when are we going to bring back football? <laughs> as soon as I heard that, I knew exactly who it was. <laughs> Frank Meacham is a native of San Luis Obispo County and an active member of his community of Paso Robles. He attended Cuesta College in 1965 and he played on Cuesta College's first football team. Frank continued to take classes at Cuesta at various points throughout his life in order to increase his writing and public speaking skills and hopes to take more classes from the North County campus now that he is retired. 
Frank is a U.S. Navy veteran serving from 1966 to 1970 on active duty and from 1970 to 72 as a reserve. Although Frank is a licensed electrical engineer as well as a licensed financial advisor, he may be w more well known for his life in the public sector. Frank started his public career in 1996 as a planning commissioner for the city of Paso Robles. He was elected to the city of Paso Robles as a uh, council member uh, in 1998 and was elected as the first elected mayor of the city in 2000. He served as mayor for a total of eight years. In 2007, Frank decided to run for the Board of Supervisors to represent District 1. I don't know how smart that was. But no. <laughs> and successfully won the election in 2008, taking office in 2009. And Frank served on the Board of Supervisors for a total of eight years. During his time as supervisor, Frank served as a board member for the Twin Cities Community Hospital, Paso Robles High School Technology Academy, Nacimento Water Commission, Paso Robles County Council of Governments, and spearheaded the establishment of the City of Paso Robles' first youth commission. Frank has been a tireless advocate for San Luis Obispo County and his community, and a true public servant. He and his wife, Deb, have a combined family of six children and nine grandchildren, as well as two dogs, Jack and Jill. Jill. I was just seeing if they would catch it, see? <laughs> as Frank continues his journey into retirement, we'd like to wish him well and recognize him as Cuesta College's 2017 Honored Alums. Frank, thank you. Well, thank you. I asked Dr. Stork, I don't know why you did this. He said, well, we were scraping the bottom of the barrel. We had to find somebody. <laughs> it's been a long time, uh, over 50 years. And I can remember out there clearly, you had to dodge not only cattle, but the cattle pies that were between classrooms. And it wasn't unusual to see a cow stick his head through the front door <clears throat> of one of the barracks as you were going through a class. But I think some of my most fond memories of this campus was playing football here. It was a pretty unique experience, one in which we would line up on one end of the field, walk to the other end, walk back, tossing rocks off the field, because it was a dirt field. And no, we did not play with leather helmets. They were <laughs> full on. And it was a time that we didn't even have a mascot name. It wasn't the Cuesta Cougars at the, very, at the very beginning. And there was a sports editor by the name of Johnny Nettleship that wrote for the Tribune. And our head coach was Vern Rosine. So he dubbed us Rosine's Roses. That did not go over well with the football team. <laughs> Consequently, we said, we need to hurry up and get a, a mascot. And uh, the Cougars came to be. The other person I remember so well, besides Warren Hansen, who was he seems like he never ages. The guy is always looking like he's still when he was my coach. But it was Miss McCorkle, who was my uh, creative writing instructor. And she encouraged me to continue writing. I, uh, I wrote, I came across a couple articles that I wrote for the Questonian years ago. And she continued to push and say, you can do this. And when I wrote a novel, she wrote me a letter and she said, I knew it, I knew it, I knew it. All along, you'd get there. <laughs> Quest has been very good to me. And I, as Dr. Stork had mentioned, now that I have a lot more time in my hands and a bigger smile on my face, um, being retired, I intend to take more classes and continue at Cuesta. Thank you, this is a great honor. And seeing some of the names out there on that wall, um, Greg Welch, Rusty Kuntz, um, I, I went to school with these guys, Dale Gomer, and I served with Kachu Asajian and worked with Sam Blakesley. Great community we have here. Thank you very much. The importance of inviting back our honored alums is not only to say thank you to them for what they've done with the privilege of having an education, 
but also to remind us every day of the opportunity we have to make an impact and help somebody change their life and make it better. That is our, that is our challenge, that is our obligation, um, and that is the gift that we can provide for our students and for each other. So to hear their stories, to hear them single out people that, they, that touched their lives 20, 30, 40, even 50 years ago, um, is really a statement of the power that we have in this profession that we've chosen to engage in. So thank you again for reminding us, uh, Frank and Jim, of the, uh, of the power of, and the opportunity that we have uh, to give people like yourself that start, that reminder, that hope, and that, uh, uh, that arsenal of tools to be able to be successful. So thank you. So at this time, we'd like to turn our attention to our presentations, and I would like to invite uh, back up to the podium uh, Pat Ewens. Pat's our Vice President for Student Services, and she's going to enlighten us on the release and launch of Maxient. Thank you, Pat. Good morning again. Um, if you teach a general education class or if you're a counselor or if you're in my position, you have heard many, many times students coming into your office saying, why do I have to take that class? Uh, I'm majoring in X, Y, Z. Why do I have to take a class in ABC? I'm never going to use that. And so you have your, your speech about, you know, an educated person knows uh, this information and as a college graduate you're going to need to know this information. So I'm going to talk to you today about three things and you may be sitting there going, I don't need to know this stuff. I'm never going to use it. And I actually, quite honestly, I hope you probably don't have to use it. But as an employee of the college, you need to know it's out there and it's available and how it works. So I'm going to talk about three things. The first one is, okay. uh, the first one is, um, uh, the student incident and well-being referral. And that's been out there for the better part of this past fall semester, and some of you have used it. Uh, the pro this, is, this is where you can tell us about a student that you're concerned about, uh, whether you're concerned about their well-being, maybe their, their writing in their English class has become very dark or is expressing uh, despair or uh, something that gives you reason for concern. Um, you know, maybe they are talking about hurting themselves or hurting someone else and you're going, ding, 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 I need to pay attention to this, and we, we hope you do. Um, so this is a referral form that you can easily use to get that information to the right place so that we can provide assistance to that student. And, and, and that's our goal. In all these cases, the, the purpose of each one of these forms is to uh, get the students the assistance that they need in a, in a timely manner. Um, this, it, the incident might be something like a violation of the student code of conduct. And that could be, um, you know, a threatening comment or uh, academic dishonesty, which is probably the most common. And, and many of you will uh, have a student that engages in academic dishonesty in your class. And so this is a way that you can document that situation Make sure the student is held accountable for the mistake that they made um, and, and, and get that information to us. It's really, really, really important that we teach our students that, th that they will learn from their mistakes. We want to hold them accountable. We're not out here to whack anybody or to you know, punish or get rid of students. That's not the point at all. The point is to teach because that's what we do. And sometimes we teach students, um, we use their mistakes as the teachable moment. So let me show you where to find that form. And I'm, I'm, you know, I could have set this up so it just worked perfectly, but I'm doing it live, so it may not work. But let's see what happens. Okay. So everybody goes to the portal. Of course, it's 
No, this is not a touch, is it? Okay. So you would just log into your portal. And under work life, all the way down here under forms. Come on. Come on, baby. There we go. Under forms, you'll see the student incident well-being referral. It's as easy to get to as that. You can also go to the Vice President of Student Services page. It's there also, but this is probably the easiest place to find it. You might have to authenticate again. Okay, so here's a student incident well-being report. And what happens when you submit this report is it comes directly to my desk, onto my desktop, and it goes directly to Kaylee, who's my admin assistant, okay? So we see that immediately. If, if it is urgent, obviously, if, you, if somebody's in danger, if the student's in danger, if the college or the environment or you or other students are in danger, you're gonna call the police. You're not gonna wait around to submit this form and let me get it and then call you back and say, you know. But this will document what's been happening. So it's, it's very self-explanatory. You enter your name, you enter your position or your title, your phone number, your email address, and then you tell us what kind of a report it is. Is this a conduct code violation? Academic integrity? Well-being? You're just worried about this student? Let us know what type of a report we're looking at here. And you may be concerned about a student, and later on we may say, you know what, that also involved a, a violation of student code of conduct, so we're going to look at it that way too. But this gets us started. You let us know what the urgency is. If you tell me it's urgent and time sensitive, it comes directly to my text. I don't know if that's a violation of some contract either, but uh, it comes directly to my text. So, you know, I, on, my, on my bedside table, it goes ding, ding, ding in the middle of the night. So don't do that unless it really is. Uh, so, but, and if it's an emergency, again, call the campus police. You can do this afterwards. Whoops. Where's my little mouse when I need it? Okay. So you can put in the date of the report. We've got handy dandy drop down calendars where it occurred. So we want to know if it's on San Luis Obispo County, if it's in the parking lot, if it's in the classroom. Is it at North County? Is it at South County? So you get all, a bunch of choices here. And then you're going to tell us about the student. You want to give us the name of the student the gender, and what role that student is. Are they a alleged that we think they've done something? Okay. Are they the victim of something? Is it a witness to an, you know, an event that, that occurred? Or are you just worried about the student? So you choose one of those things. And you, if there are several students involved, you can keep adding names as many, many times as you need to. And then basically, we wanted you to tell us what happened. It's important that when you describe what occurred, that you tell us what you actually saw. Don't interpret. Don't make a diagnosis. Uh, like any record, this is public. We don't typically share the whole thing with a student, but a student can certainly request it, and we will share it. So you try to avoid things like saying the student's a real jerk. And you might say, describe the behavior that makes you feel like the student's a jerk, okay? Or describe, you don't want to say the student is depressed because I don't know what that looks like. But if you tell me the first two weeks of class the student was involved and uh, you know, answering questions and doing their homework and now they put their head down on the desk and cry uncontrollably for 10 minutes. Okay, now I've got a picture. Now I know what I'm, what I'm going to be dealing with. I know what referral to make for that student. So be descriptive, but don't be judgmental or you know, diagnostic. Let us know if you involve the campus police. And please never, ever hesitate to involve our, we have a wonderful police department 
who will come and talk with students, will come and make sure you feel safe, make sure our students feel safe. Please, and I know Brian will corroborate this, you are not bothering them. Please call our police and let them provide the assistance that they're here for. You can include attachments. This is helpful if you're doing academic dishonesty. Perhaps you have a plagiarized paper. You can attach that and uh, it becomes part of the documentation process. Ideally, you've had a chance to talk to the student about this. We don't want a student to be surprised by getting a letter from me saying, you were engaged in academic dishonesty in your history class. They should have heard that from their history instructor first. Um, so don't, I don't want to surprise anybody. So we will want to make sure that you've had this discussion with students. Now, it's not always possible. Sometimes a student might be upset, they might leave the classroom, you know, scream obscenities, kick the trash can, slam the door, and out they go. Okay, that concerns you. That's a disruption of class. It might be a concern, it might be a violation of student code of conduct, but you might not have had a chance to stop that student and say, let's talk about this. Okay. That's okay too. So submit this and we'll get to the point where you're gonna talk about it. And then let us know if this is an ongoing thing. One of the biggest problems we have is not nipping a behavior in the bud kind of at the beginning and waiting until it becomes intolerable in the classroom. And then you say, this has been going on for six weeks. This student interrupts my lecture, they da da da. Well, we should have dealt with it on week one. Or maybe week two, when you saw it was now becoming a pattern of behavior. Please don't wait. It's a lot harder to deal with it at the end of the day. And oftentimes we can't get that student back into the groove uh, and, and have them successfully complete the class, which is, of course, our goal. This is also something that's available to, to anyone in an office, at, at, in a department. Um, if, a, if you're dealing with a student that worries you or that is violating the student code of conduct, you can use this form to get that information to us. Now, once that comes to us, what happens is we have a team called CERT, S-I-R-T, the Student Incident Response Team. We meet every week. We look at any of these things that have come through, and we, make, we refer them out. We make a determination. Should we have somebody from the health center call this student and let them know about the counseling that's available? Should we have somebody go and, you know, and facilitate a meeting between the instructor and the student? What's, what does the student need? And then we, we put that into action. We will get back to you and let you know what happened. Okay, so that you, if this just didn't go into a black hole someplace. Okay, so we can't always tell you what the results are. Sometimes there's confidential issues that we cannot disclose, but we will let you know that you, you're, you were heard and that something was done, okay? Uh, so that's basically the form. It's very easy to use, very easy to find, uh, and it documents the process. The other thing, as a faculty member, of course, you, you have the right to exclude a student from class for cause. Keep in mind that is your a basic right as a faculty member. You can say to the student, we're not having a productive time today because of X, Y, Z. You are excused from class and the next class until we can get a chance to sit down and talk so I can let you know what my expectations are. That is perfectly within your rights as a faculty member. But if you do that, I need you to submit one of these forms so we know what's happening. This just documents what's going on with that student and how it's been dealt with. So if that's what you're doing, please also submit one of these forms. Any questions on, on this, how it works? Yes, sir, I can't see you, oh, there you are, uh-huh. Well, uh, ideally you don't want to blast the student in front of the class. That never does any good at all. Uh, a lot of times it's situational. Ideally, if I were in that situation and I had a student that was disruptive, if the opportunity gave itself up, I would say, class, we're going to take a five minute break. And Susan, can I see you for just a second? And then I would say, Susan, you've been interrupting me. You've been rude. You've been, uh, you know, you're, you're on your cell phone. You're X, Y, Z, outline the behavior that's unacceptable. Say, Susan, I'm going to exclude you from class right now. 
and you know, we'll talk about it. I want you to come to my office or I want you to meet me after class or whatever and we'll talk about what you need to do to return. You know, that is, is the kindest way, even though you may want to scream your head off at Susan in front of everybody and say, you know, get the, the out of here. Um, that's usually not the most productive way to go about it. So, yes? We haven't found one it doesn't work on. So the old one, yeah, the old one, uh, the old form didn't. Uh, this is uh, through a company called Maxient, which is a name you really don't even need to remember because it has nothing, you won't need to use it. But um, it should work on all browsers and, and phones and iPads and all that good stuff. Okay, yeah. Okay, what's my extension? Third, three, one, one. I, you know how to find me. Yeah, if we're just, if, yeah, and I, I'm very happy to brainstorm. And, and a lot of times we take care of things like that. You're right, with a brainstorm. And that's all we need. We're certainly not stopping that. Yeah. I certainly hope so. Yeah. Um, actually, one of the things that when you submit this form, you will automatically get a, you have submitted this form and we have received it. You'll get a little automatic reply. You can also have this emailed to you. You know, you can, uh, and there's a box at the bottom where you say, please email me a copy. You can get that. And yes, hopefully you would hear something back from someone saying we got it and, and here's where we went with it. Anything else? Okay, this one this is this most lengthy one. So the, I'm going to show you two other forms. Let's see. I get back. No. Okay, how do I get out of here? Scroll up to the top. I don't submit the form. I just get it afterwards. Okay. Um, come on. There we go. Okay. Back to my Cuesta page, back to your home page, work, the work life tab. And the next one is the student accident form. Again, we've always had a student accident form. It's been a paper form. It, essentially, it's the same thing now, except it's electronic. And the cool thing about this form is once it's filled out, it goes immediately to me, to Joan, and to Brian. So we know what has happened on our campus. It's then easily, uh, we can easily shoot it electronically to Terry if there's something that needs to be repaired, or, or whomever needs to know about this. So ideally, the student accident form is filled out by the person, the student, who had the accident. This is not for faculty. This Faculty are different. We still do that with HR. Um, it's workman's comp kinds of things. But for students, this is the form we want them to use. Okay? It's also on the student portal, so they can get to it that way. They can go to the health center. The health center will pull it up. This just helps keep everything documented in one place. So. Again, it's just, uh, it's essentially the same form. They, you tell them what kind of a form I was injured or else I'm reporting for a person who was injured. Either one of those is okay. Ideally, it's always the person who was injured. It lets us give a date when that occurred. We ask for a location where it occurred. Very self-explanatory. You can add, you know, if a whole bunch of people tripped over that, you can add all their names, okay. And, uh, and they will create separate reports for each of them. So this one, you will rarely have to use this, but you may need to be able to refer a student where to find it, okay, or to assist a student in filling it out. Question? Yeah, yeah, Tanya. Okay. Okay, we'll, we may have to talk about that. That was not what it said on the original form, but we can, we can change that, doesn't matter. The question was, uh, is it supposed to be a witness who fills it out or the actual student who fills it out? Either way, whoever fills the form out, you can indicate who, who it is, okay? And we'll get some clarification for you on that. Okay, we also wanna know if there was medical attention 
received, if, you know, if transport was required, any of that, okay? Again, supporting documentation can also be attached. Very easy form to fill out, not a whole lot different than the other one, except instead of a piece of paper floating around, it's electrons floating around. Okay. Oh, yes, yes. If, if you wanted them to get that report? If you wanted them to get that report, well, you could have it emailed to yourself and then forward it on to whomever, okay? Uh, this report typically always went to the Student Health Center and, and possibly risk management and that type of thing. Uh, and that's where it goes automatically. But you can email it to yourself and forward it to anybody you want to, okay? Okay, and last but not least, uh, there was, has always been a student complaint process, and there have been forms where, that a student, you know, once they get to certain levels that they can fill out. The student complaint process is now an electronic form, basically asking the same questions it has always asked. It is on the student part of the web, student on MyQuesta, and the student gets a cop the student complaint process. What happens if I've got a complaint? If I have a complaint about my instructor, if I have a complaint about a college policy, if I have a complaint about somebody that I interacted with, you know, what do I do? So this takes them to this part of the web and tells them what they do. And the first part of any complaint, of course, is to talk to the person with whom you have the issue. So always, 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 if a student has a complaint about an instructor, we say, have you talked to the instructor? Okay, so that's the first process. If they have talked to the instructor and they still have not come to resolution, or they have talked to the person in financial aid and they still haven't come to resolution, then they can fill out a complaint. And we're required to have a complaint process for students. So this becomes a little bit easier. The outline, it's outlined again. If it's an academic concern, we ask them to speak with the faculty member, then it goes to the division chair, then it goes to the dean, then it goes to the vice president, and if there still is no resolution, there is a grievance process, okay? But the student would need to go through the informal process first. If it's a non-academic concern, we ask them that they speak to the chair, a supervisor, somebody in the department to try to get resolution. Nine times out of 10, 99 times out of 100, that resolves the whole thing, and we never need to do this form. So this is only after that has not been successful. This form again comes to me, and I will disp disperse it to whomever. Okay. What happened? What was your concern? Please tell us what you're concerned about. We have to tell students that depending on what they say, we can't guarantee that this is going to be confidential. A lot of times students want to come, I want to complain about this person, but I don't want them to know it was me. Well. <laughs> That's pretty tough, because when I go to a faculty member or a person in a department and I say, we've had a complaint, uh, you know, a person that said, you, you know, did not, you denied them this or you did X, Y, Z or what, they know who you're talking about. There's no anonymity here. So we want to make sure that students, I don't want anonymous. I'm not promising anybody anonymous. So if you have a complaint, you have to stand up, be recognized, and know that you get to talk about it, and you get to talk to that person about your complaint. We ask for any, if there, anybody else saw it, if you've talked to anybody, and what do you want to have happen? A lot of times they say, I want that person fired. Well, okay, yeah, uh, not gonna happen. Um, but it, it allows a student to talk about what, I, I don't want anything to happen, I just want somebody to know. Well. That, that, again, that also depends on, on, on the situation. One of the things that concerns me is many times when a student is making an appeal, they're appealing a financial aid decision, they're appealing uh, a third repetition of a class or something like that, they make some accusations, allegations, uh, about what happened in that class and why they were not successful. It's, you know, I had, the teacher was mean to me, or I didn't get my DSPS accommodations, or, you know, on and on and on. 
And if that's true, I want to know about it. I want to deal with it. If it's not true, now the student has furnished false information to the college. And that's a violation of the student code of conduct. And I want students to be held accountable for that. So it, it, this, this is an important learning experience for students. And if a student wants to make a complaint, refer them to this process, refer them to my office, and we'll walk them through it. If it's a legitimate complaint, we will deal with it. If it's not a legitimate complaint, we will deal with it. Any questions about that? Yes. No. And, yeah, and on the bottom of the complaint process, it says, if this is sexual harassment, and it refers them directly to, to Melissa, where, where anything, any Title IX violation or anything like that uh, goes directly to Melissa and is dealt with in that office. Okay, thank you for asking that. It is on the form and it does explain that. If it were to come to us by mistake, we would just send it directly there. Any other questions? I'm getting the hook. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Pat. At this time, we're going to uh, move into Cynthia Wilsh's uh, presentation on uh, Canvas. So, Cynthia, here she comes. Here she is. Give her an applause. Yes, yes, yes. Here she comes and her team. Come on down. Yeah. So as you know, we're, we're making this huge transition into Canvas, and we wanted to gen generate some excitement about the possibility of Canvas, because as we've been making this move, we've discovered some really great things about Canvas, and we wanted to share them with everybody. Um, and know that Canvas is not just for DE classes. Um, Canvas is going to be used campus-wide for all of our classes and all of our students to utilize. And one of the other exciting things that I've learned, too, is that we can use it uh, in the campus for resources that we can share with one another. So I've created a faculty professional development page that we as faculty can go and get resources. So in our departments or our, um, you know, individually on campus, we can use this as a portal to share information and files. And so we just wanted to show you how confident you can be in Canvas, how easy it is to use, and some of the creative ways that you can use Canvas to kind of celebrate with your students and help them be successful, as well as other um, you know, faculty um, in campus. So one of the things I got super excited about is because I don't like just plain, simple things. I'm an exciting person. And so I like to create variety. <laughs> and one of the things I really liked was the um, ability to add course cards um, to your campus, your Canvas um, screen. So when a student logs in, they don't just see a whole bunch of different colors, but they can have an exciting image that's going to invite them into their class and encourage them to go in and try something new or see what resources might exist there. Um, but I do have this wonderful team, and they're all going to share different things. My two things were the Canvas card, and the other one was uploading files in one step. Um, if you've used my Cuesta before or my courses, you had to go individually and add each file one at a time. And if you had, you know, 20 handouts for the whole semester, it took you some time to get those up there. Uh, with Canvas, we can put all those files out there for our students, and I can select all of them in one step and say, I want these 20 files up here right now. And within a snap, all my files are there and my students have access to them. And I can also time release them, so my students don't have to see everything that I want them to see over the semester, but when I want them to see it, I can say what day they get to see this particular file. So those are two quick things that you could do in your Canvas class that's gonna create some, um, make your life a little bit easier and um, get resources to your students quick and easy. 
Um, Matt Vasquez, you're on. Uh, I, I was told I have 90 seconds. Seriously, who gives a speech teacher 90 seconds to talk? We do. Yeah. Um, yeah, I know. I'm down. I got, I'm down to 70. I'm going to take Greg's 90. Um, uh, what, the, the cool thing about Canvas is that it's it's multifaceted. Okay. Um, there, there are multiple levels that you can work with in Canvas, and one of them is in, in terms of grading and communication. Um, and as we all know, grading typically is not multifaceted. You're making comments on a paper or doing something like that. With Canvas, we can take it much. We can take it into the human realm a little bit more because it allows for you to do. Um, video commenting or video grading or video, I call it a video evaluation. And the beauty about this is this, and just as a little side note here, I've been doing this for a couple of years now, um, I have never had any negative comments about the video evaluations that I've done. As a matter of fact, all the comments that come back say one very specific thing, wow, you don't hate me, okay? Uh, and two, that was, that was more information than I get on a page because in two minutes, I can tell a student what they need to do, right, with more in depth than I can by writing side comments or, or how, whatever it happens to be, whatever grading it is that I'm, that I'm doing there. The second part of it is, is that I get to tell that student, they get to see my face and they get to hear me say, hey, look, right, I know you missed the mark that you were looking for here, but I want to let you know that, that I, I like where you're going. And here are the three things I'm going to help you do to get where you need to be, okay? So there's opportunities for instruction in the evaluation, the video evaluation. There's opportunities for them to see that right, these are not mean comments that are there on the paper. And more importantly, in distance ed, it's an opportunity for them to actually kind of have this interaction with you because they can make a video back for you too. So uh, that's my 90 seconds. <laughs> Thank you. And Greg Baxley, he uses this for his face-to-face -face classes. Yeah, Greg. Uh, I use Canvas to do reading questions. I know some of us have issues with getting our students to read the textbook, either before or after they show up to class. And this helps them, or it helps me, know that they at least flipped through the textbook to find some of the answers for the reading questions. So I assign these. They're due in Canvas before they come to class. And they're easy to grade. I copy the grading key from one of the best students in the class. I just flip through, find the right answer, copy their answers, and then when I'm grading them in Canvas in the speed grader, when I find a student that has a wrong answer, I type, number one is wrong, I paste the whole key. I don't bother separating it out, I just paste the whole thing, and they get all the answers to the reading questions right then and there, if they've done the assignment. If it's blank, they just get a zero and I move on. Uh, the other thing that I do is something that I just totally forgot about. Um, what is it? It's that. Oh, and Matt took all my time, so. <laughs> yeah. But it's something I just thought of that I do in Canvas that was really up. cool. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Next up. Um, well, the, the ability to, uh, a lot of us are going to use announcements to remind students that they've got something going on, whether it's face-to-face -face or a DE class, but one of the nice things is that you can put those announcements right there on their home page, so when they go into the class, they don't have to go find the announcement, they can see the announcement, so it's, it's going to be very visible to them in one place. And I have to stand up here. So for me, the... Um Technology comes second to being a great teacher and, and finding good ways to connect with students. And so for me, Canvas allows that to happen still. I think uh, with, with Moodle in the past, I ran into feeling that I couldn't present things in as clear and concise a way that got students to do what I wanted them to do quickly, right? Because that, you don't want any noise. So I did a flex activity yesterday on this and eliminating the noise. Now, what this shows you is my orange uh, comments there. The page itself is the home page for my students when they arrive each week, virtually or in class actually. It works as a syllabus uh, schedule that way as well. And that they can arrive at this page and, and think a, a few things. I wanna be here. This looks interesting. This looks like it has character. This, this transmits what I am in front of a class, I hope, as much as, as it can. 
and it gets them to do what I want them to do as quickly as possible. So I am um, given uh, the, the bribery of chocolate, willing to sit down with any of you and brainstorm, because I don't know everything about this, but I sat for two years um, with Moodle and with this, doing surveys over and over again with my students and saying, what is the crap that's getting in the way and what's the good stuff that gets you doing what you want to do? And so for me, that was taking a home page that changed every week but looked the same and that had very clear instructions with no noise on the sides. And here's an example of that where there's almost nothing there that's going to get in the way of them doing the work they need to do. And then once they're in the work, it's creative, it's dynamic, and it makes them want to continue. And so that's what I feel Canvas has done for me. And I uh, love teaching in front of students. I think that they enjoy my classes. And I think if you're a great teacher, the, the DE modality doesn't change that. It's different, but I have students who say they've learned more from me in a virtual class than they ever did in any face-to-face. -face. I have students who, who say they're connected with their fellow uh, students in the class. And so it really, to me, is you want a platform that allows you to be yourself and be creative. And so take away the noise, get the technology that most benefits your style of teaching, and ignore the rest. Because the technology will ultimately change and we'll have, I hate to say it, someday, we'll be talking about another canvas or whatever. But if you focus on your quality of your assignments and the basics, everything else falls into place. And to me, the good teaching can continue. So feel free to stop by my office with chocolate and I'm happy to brainstorm with anybody. <laughs> And so Sherry Moore. OK, I have a couple of slides here. And I'm really excited about SpeedGrader. SpeedGrader, super fast. You go in there. And what's fast about it is you go from one student to the next pretty easily. And now when I do diet analysis submissions and projects, I can look at their papers. I can look at their documents without even having to open the files. If they just attach them, they're just right there for me. I don't even have to click and open them. I don't have to download them, make comments, upload them. It's right there where I can do a, a point, like an, an area comment or a point comment. I can use different colors to highlight. I can use different colors for texting. I can do drawing. I can circle something on their diet analysis printout and make a comment about it. It looks complicated maybe, up there, or you probably can't see it because it's so tiny, but, but it's really simple, super simple, super fast. And the students comment back, and we end up commenting back and forth in there in SpeedGrader. It's really easy to see that. So I love that I don't have to download, upload. It allows me to have a lot better uh, regular and effective feedback with my students. I had a Moodle class last semester and a Canvas, and I always thought Moodle was great. I loved Moodle. I thought it was wonderful. I thought, oh no, I'm changing to something else, you know, at first too. But as soon as, as soon as that Canvas class started, I could see the difference. And all the way through the semester, I was wishing I would have done in both Canvas. I felt so much more connected to the, to the Canvas students. So my second slide that I have is sending video messages. And um, once a week on Monday mornings, that's me. I didn't catch a very good shot there when I screenshot it. But me in my house, my home office, um, Monday morning, I'll I'll do a little video message to them, kind of check in for the week, talk to them, tell them, you know, what's going on, and, and that's fun. They like that, and I've been getting good feedback. They wanted to do it, too, so they started um, doing these to me. Um, they can reply to discussions that way. I can reply to discussions that way. Um, as you saw with Matt, um, you can grade that way. This video thing, you're looking at them, you're talking to them. So I love doing these little video messages, but they're easy. You'll say, well, I could do that always. I could do it on my phone, I could upload it. This isn't like that. You go into your inbox here on Canvas, and when you click on message, you either click on the little you know, record or you type. And it's actually just as fast for me to click on record and say something. I don't have to spell check it. And I just send, and it's off to the students. So really cool. We are very excited about Canvas. And even if you're not a DE instructor, this is all stuff you can do. You're going to be going off my courses using Canvas to store your files and things. These are things you can do in your face-to-face -face classes as well. Oh, we all have a question? I went over, I think. Sh 
She wants to know if you can post a video message on your home page. Announcement. Yes. Yes. Yes, the, the multimedia. The insert multimedia tool is in all facets of Canvas. So whether it's on a page, in a discussion, in grading, or announcements, anywhere in there, there's a little media button that you and students both have. And all you do is click on it, record, and it doesn't even have to be video. You can just send audio message, too. So. Um, and this is kind of the same idea, but um, Kevin Bottenball and I were trying to find a way when you have multiple classes that you're teaching, you know, we have one office on campus that our students come to. We don't say, um, my Monday, Wednesday students come on this day at this time, and my Tuesday, Thursday students come on this day at this time. But in Canvas, we were trying to figure out how can we em emulate that same environment and kind of coordinating with both um, another free service that we have access to, CCC um, Confer Zoom and um, Canvas, they integrate together so that you can create an environment where you can do virtual online office hours and invite your students to attend one location that you can interact with them. Um, this is great even for face-to-face -face class. Your students are struggling. They've got that assignment due tomorrow and they wanted to get an answer today. And they can zoom in with you and you can talk about it. You can share your screens and invite them to you know, talk about the assignment and get the work done quick, fast, and on time when you want your assignments turned in. So um, utilizing the tools combined together, you can create that environment where your students are coming to your office when you want them to come. And then Elizabeth is going to talk about the grade book. So I teach face-to-face -face classes. And last semester, I used Canvas. And I, um, I had a really great experience. It's very direct. It's very intuitive. And so in the grading process, I didn't have to um, begin, like click a button to begin editing. I didn't have to update with a button after. I just directly entered the grades, moved from cell to cell using the arrow keys. I was able to um, designate extra credit in one step. And my online textbook platform scores funneled directly into my grade book. Also, students were able to check all of their grades ongoing throughout the class. And they could um, enter a what if score to calculate their grade. And so it was incredibly valuable for me. And I know you're going to enjoy it as well. And um, one of Elizabeth's students is here to talk about his experience. He's an ESL student. And so we have Wei to talk about his experience as a student perspective using Canvas. Hi, how are you? I'm away. So Canvas to me is a kind of tour. So I took a class, nutrition class, of my professor at uh, that's what I like to use uh, to use that uh, Canvas. Canvas like my buddy, like my friend. <laughs> it is always smiling to me. I just go there, click, have a look. My grade there, what kind of grade I got. Uh, my uh, assignments I must complete. I will review some notes and. Uh, check the lecture and some review notes there. I like to use the Canvas. I think it is much better than Moodle's. Just like, uh, you know, uh, uh, just like if you want to search a restaurant, you want to have a meal, you will go to Yelp, click which one is the best choice. If you want to get your balance of your mind and your uh, spirit and your body, you practice uh, Tai Chi because I take that class that a uh, great teacher, Shiro, just uh, received that uh, uh, rewards. Uh, I, uh, I was the student at that, uh, her class, College Success, talking about uh, practicing Tai Chi. So this is just like my Tai Chi. I practice uh, using that canvas. Pretty cool. It's very friendly and easy to use. That's all. And I have, we have one more. We have Ron um, Clark, and he's going to talk about integrating with Turnitin. Good morning.
morning. Um, I use Turnitin for, well, I've got a, my discipline is writing heavy, reading heavy, and um, the students, I require them to use Turnitin to submit all their papers. It, it helps me to catch um, plagiarism. You know, I don't use it as a club so much as a tool for my students. I try to get them to uh, resubmit papers multiple times during the week so that they can see what they need to change in their paper to make it better. Um, and then I use a couple of items in the grade marks or in the, the grading to, to kind of help strengthen what I'm seeing in their paper to help them improve. Um, I use grade marks, which are essentially uh, items that I create in the grading that are comments. And I just plug them in where I need to put them, you know, spelling, uh, grammatical errors, things like that. And um, I also use um, a rubric, a grading rubric, to sort of um, help give them an idea of where their similarity index is, what they need to do with their grammar, um, you know, whether they've got the, the, all the items that I'm looking for in a paper. Um, finally, to sum everything up, I use audio comments. Now, unlike Matt, I choose audio comments because I really think the students don't want to look at my ugly mug. You know, um, so I, I use these audio comments and it builds a connection between the student and the instructor in a way that you don't normally see in a DE class. Um, DE can be cold and a little bit removed and by using those audio comments, um, you know, I'm, I'm building a better connection for them. And uh, the students, have, the feedback that I've got back is they really appreciate uh, those audio comments. Now, um, I wanted to also comment on the fact that face-to-face -face instructors, if you are using Turnitin, this is something you can do as well. So it's not just uh, related to distance education. It can also be used in a face-to-face -face, uh, format. Thank you. The other thing I wanted to mention, oh, Karina's got a question. Oh, good, thanks, yeah. Done. I don't know what I'm doing here. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it, it's going to integrate as an external tool. Yeah. Speaking of integration, if you use any kind of online homework system like uh, Pearson Mastering or McGraw-Hill, the Canvas interface um, does work now with those two products. And so it can turn into a single log on for your students. So I use Pearson Mastering for chemistry, and the students can log into Canvas. They just click on the, the uh, My Pearson product, and it launches them right into their uh, online homework system. And then the grades do get uploaded, like Elizabeth mentioned. The grades automatically sync between the two systems. So if you're using it for DE or face-to-face, -face, now there's a single log on. You don't have to worry about course ID codes to submit to students, because it's all just taken care of through Canvas when they log in Canvas. It's pretty slick so far. Um, but if you are using Pearson stuff, there's a kind of an issue with importing courses and assignments you have to be aware of, so be careful of that. Yeah, there, there's been some great integrations with that, and the nice thing is, is when you do integrate those softwares, you ha you know, because you still have, even with your face-to-face -face class, other assignments you do in class that are not driven through the homework system, and so now you can have one grade book instead of trying to manage all your in-class assignments in one grade book and then the online grade book with the publisher. It's all in one grade book, which is really nice. Um, and then I just wanted to let you know we are doing, Sean, Landers, and I have teamed up, and we've got lots of training available for Canvas, because this is it, guys. Fall 2017 is the rollout date, so this is the semester you got to get on board and um, get your training. So literally, I think, what, Sean, we have like probably two or three training sessions every week. So you're going to see five, some, day, some weeks we've got five between DE focus, non-DE focus. So watch for emails from Sean and I to just remind you where to go and when to be there. We tried to pick a bunch of variety of days and times to hopefully hit everybody's um, schedules and he and I both are available for um, you know one-on-one. -on -one. I have got some open labs Thursdays um, San Luis in the evening Wednesdays up in the North County so but reach out because we're here these wonderful people who came up here with me today um, I'm putting you on the spot but I think they would be willing to help you too <laughs> so questions
Yeah, the, the student doesn't get to choose. It's the faculty member who is essentially making that decision. But when the, the faculty member, if it's a DE class, it should be in your welcome letter. Or if you send them a, a welcome email, probably tonight, because classes start Tuesday, um, let them know what system you're using. I did put an announcement in both Moodle and in Canvas that says, if you don't see your class here, go look in Canvas and you might see your class there. So the faculty member needs to let the student know what system they're going to use for their class. So. Before they've registered, it should be in their welcome letter for the DE class, yeah. That's a great question, because um, Canvas is naturally accessible. Everything built into Canvas is ADA compliant. The things that you put into Canvas still also have to be accessible, which is a really important component. So the captioning that's built into Canvas doesn't, there's no captioning on that. So if you have a student that is hard of hearing or deaf, then you need to make sure that you are captioning them. And I would recommend using something like um, Screencast-O-Matic or um, snag it to grab that and then you can go into Camtasia or um, a couple other softwares that exist that you could quickly caption them and then you can upload it as a separate file so you can still upload video for that student you would have to do a separate process great question any others Yes, so if you're teaching in DE, <laughs> um, talk to Deborah. There's some training. So if you're doing, because all of our training in house is totally free, you don't need to pay for that. Oh, for your time. Okay. Yes. Please talk to Deborah Stakes if you're teaching in DE. In Canvas, there are some size limitations. Um, I would actually recommend that you use another free portal that's sponsored through the Chancellor's Office, 3C Media, to upload any media content there and then link it or embed it into your Canvas course because you have unlimited storage space out there um, and not impact Canvas as much. Oh, yes, yeah, so that would be great if you use the, a different tool to create the video. Then you can take it to 3C Media and for free using the DECT grant, the DETC grant that the College of Canyons fund has received the funding for, there's free captioning. So any videos you have right now, totally free captioning. And I'm getting the hook too. <laughs> but go ahead, Bailey, one more question. In best practices, yes. You should be captioning every video that you publish. Um, if it's a one-time use, there are some exceptions to that. But um, come to me. I have an accessibility workshop I'm going to be doing, and we'll talk about that there and look at some resources for that. Yeah. Thank you, and um, do seek out training because we're here, all of us. Thank you very much, uh, Cynthia and Cynthia's army. I appreciate the, uh, the involvement um, with everybody uh, during this transition period. As I promised you earlier, you were going to have the opportunity to spend a few more minutes uh, with me as I share with you some of my thoughts uh, this spring a semester and the launch of 2017. You know, first of all, I want to provide a sincere thank you to all of you for taking the time to be here this morning. I hope you found that uh, the information, the recognitions have been meaningful and helpful to you to see where we're going as an institution, the importance of the jobs that we have, uh, and the direction that we're going to, to move in. 
I also want to acknowledge uh, those employees who will be retiring this spring. Thank you to Jean and Marta, Rich, Gary, and Mark for your years of service of Cuesta College, but more importantly, for the passion that you've brought to your work, which has influenced the experience of not only your students, but those of us who have had the privilege to work with you. Your legacy of commitment and excellence, I guarantee you will live on. I'd also like to acknowledge the award winners this morning, Vicki for her Elaine Holly Coates Service Excellence Award, and Brett for the Mamey Diffley Award, and Cheryl Zeal, the ultimate hugger, uh, for the, uh, the Vir Virginia Sullivan Inspirational Award. You truly represent many of your colleagues who share the attributes for which you have been recognized. Again, congratulations. And to our most recent honored alums, to Frank and Jim and Ted, um, I've offered my congratulations to them on this recognition and thank them for being such exemplary representatives of Acosta College education. We are very proud of their accomplishments, for the very positive ways that they have influenced the thousands of citizens within our county and beyond. And I thank them as they had to leave a little earlier for taking the time to join us this morning. You know, if we go back to fall opening day, my remarks focused on student success. Student success as defined by our students and not by our own expectations. Many of you took the time uh, to submit statements as to how you, within the role that you play here at Cuesta College, are contributing to the success of students. And I hope you've noticed that during the fall editions of the President's Newsletter, we have been incorporating uh, your statements about student success as a reminder to us all of the variety of ways that each of us can make a difference in the lives of our, of our students. So today we're going to turn our attention to another topic, and that's going to be taking a look back, preparing for the future, but by looking at the past. You know, the college began in a humble and primitive way, a cardboard box with uh, some very important documents. These, uh, this box contained the minutes of the Committee on School District Reorganization, which launched following the election in April 16, 1963, of the creation of the community, actually the San Luis Obispo County Junior College uh, District. And this, uh, and this was launched by two very determined men who were charged by the Board of Trustees in 1964 to create and build a college in San Luis Obispo County. Dr. Merlin Eisenbeis, the first president, and Dr. Frank Martinez, the very first vice president of academic affairs, took on that challenge. Today, we are fulfilling that promise to the residents of San Luis Obispo County, that each and every resident should have and will have access, local access to college. After nearly 52 years of offering classes at this Camp San Luis Obispo site, Cuesta College has truly become the come-as-you-are college, a college that focuses on access, success, and excellence. Yesterday, it was 1967, and I happened to land a job here at Cuesta College as a young 25-year-old aspiring football coach and math teacher, surrounded by colleagues that were well into their 30s and maybe even their 40s, you know. The surroundings were somewhat primitive, but the spirit of camaraderie was extremely special. Today, I'm in my 50th year of service at Cuesta College in a, tr in a profession I truly love that is filled with tremendous challenges but is rich with unlimited opportunities to change lives. Yesterday, we took on our jobs amidst primitive conditions and planned, designed, and built the San Luis Obispo campus we enjoy today. From the 1971 groundbreaking, of the first permanent building in physical education, to the science complex in 1973 and the aquatic center in 1980. 
This is the uh, view of the, just before they dug the hole for the uh, swimming pool in 1980, and the far distance is looking to the west, you see the science center that had been completed a few years before that. Today, we have the, some of the finest facilities that you could ever want. And we will continue to improve and revitalize and add more facilities that meet the needs of today's programs, services, and teaching modalities with the help of Measure L. Yesterday, dress codes in the 1960s were the norm, with coats and ties for men and dresses and skirts for women. The expectation for appropriate school wear for students was equally spelled out. Today, the uniform of the day trend appears to be anything goes. <laughs> From the prof professorial look of Dr. Gilbert to the imaginative appearance of Dr. Vasta. I went through that also, that transformation period. 1977, it was uh, powder blue denim <laughs> with lapels that you could land an airplane on. <laughs> From neckties that were four and a half inches wide, so you could spill anything and hide it, yeah. <laughs> to the ver proverbial sideburns and long hair, or in my case, comb over. And so where does that lead me today? Today my wife takes me to Nordstrom and, in, in, and uh, treats me to Canali suits and uh, Montarusso shoes and David Donahue shirts. Uh, she says I need to look presidential and that did not meet her particular expectation. <laughs> Yesterday, classrooms were equipped with desks and chairs, chalkboards, chalk, erasers, chalk chucks, maybe some maps, lab apparatus, skeletal models, where faculty primarily utilize lecture mode of teaching, and students learn by reading, listening, discussing, and practicing. Students represented maybe two generations of life experiences. Today, the classroom environment is alive. It's alive with data projectors, computers, smart boards, computerized periodical charts, iPads, smartphones, tablets, embedded tutors, all tools that allow faculty and students to, to be engaged in real-time information and imagery. Students expect to experience sound, movement, and color to be fully stimulated, stimulated in their learning. Students come from multi-generations, the boomers, the boomer echoes, the generation X, the generation Y, the cybers, all of which create an increasingly challenge for our faculty to address the learning styles of each of these students. Yesterday, community college classes were free for California residents, which allowed students barrier-free access to higher education and job skill development. Today, with the help of the Duvica Family Trust Endowment, the Promise Scholarship was created and provides funds for local high school graduates to recreate the fee-free existence that our students enjoyed in the 60s and the 70s. We are halfway there to extending this one-year promise to a full two-year program. To appreciate today, it is necessary to periodically revisit yesterday. We learn from our mistakes and our misstarts. We build upon our successes, and we prepare ourselves for inevitable change that will test our skills, our knowledge, and our values. Our preparation for the future will depend on study and analysis of the events of yesterday and the reality of today. The future of Cuesta College will be guided by the recently completed Educational and Facilities Master Plan and implemented through a series of three-year strategic plans, the first of which will be released this spring. We celebrate yesterday 
we appreciate today and we prepare ourselves for tomorrow because the future, future of Cuesta College is, is in our hands. Thank you very much and have a, a great spring semester. And so before we dismiss class, we have to make sure we remind uh, the assignment to the faculty, and that is that uh, 15 minutes after, uh, from right now, you will be starting your faculty meeting. The rest of you are released to go on and do good work. All right, thank you very much. <laughs>